Hey everyone, I'm Matt Friedman. I'm director of the University of Michigan's Museum of Paleontology and a fish paleontologist. And I'm here today to answer some questions about sharks, their fossil record, and their evolutionary history that you've sent into the Museum of Natural History. So let's see what kind of questions you have and what kind of answers I can provide. First, we have the question, were prehistoric sharks always the apex predators of the seas? Great question. When we think about the sorts of sharks that are really prominent in documentaries, books, movies, we think about predatory sharks like great whites, hammerheads, tiger sharks. But of course, we should forget the largest sharks alive today are actually plankton eaters, right? These are creatures that are filtering tiny organisms out of the water, things like basking sharks and whale sharks. But let's go back to the early evolutionist history of sharks and think about what things were like back then, over 300 million years ago during the Devonian Age of Fishes. It's at this time we start seeing the first recognizable sharks in the fossil record that are represented not just by teeth and scales, but by whole specimens, what paleontologists would call articulated fossils. And some of the most famous examples of articulated early chondrichthians, cartilaginous fishes, the group that includes sharks and their relatives like rays and ratfishes, come from not too far from Ann Arbor. They come from a fossil deposit called the Cleveland Shale in Northeast Ohio, which preserves the fossils of early fishes in exquisite detail, sometimes even with remains of soft tissues like mussels. The sharks that we find in the Cleveland Shale belong to a kind of animal called Cladosalaki, which was on the order of three feet long, about a yard long, a very streamlined creature that was certainly a predator. We know that. How do we know that? Well, we have clues from its teeth, which are sharp and pointed, but also there are specimens of Cladosalaki that are preserved with fishes inside their guts, so the remains of their last dinners. So although they were clearly fearsome predators, they inhabited the seas with creatures that were even larger than them and which we know were eating these early sharks. These included completely extinct groups of fishes, a group we called placoderms, a group of heavily armored fishes represented most famously by a creature called Dunkelosteus. Here's a model of Dunkelosteus here. So this animal was about the size of a modern great white shark on the order of 20 feet long with massive shearing bony plates at its mouth instead of teeth of the sort that we would recognize conventionally as teeth. There are specimens of both Dunkelosteus and Cladosalaki, these two neighbors in the Devonian Cleveland Shale of 360 million years ago, at the University of Michigan Museum of Natural History, which you can't see right now, but you can visit virtual models of these two creatures on the Museum of Paleontology's Umorph webpage. All right, another question. Why do paleontologists mainly find sharks' teeth and not their skeletons? Another good question. And this is one that relates to a fundamental aspect of the biology of sharks and their close relatives, rays and ratfishes. Collectively, these creatures belong to a group of fishes called the chondrichthians or the cartilaginous fishes. They're so-called because their skeletons are composed principally of cartilage, which decays rapidly after these creatures die and therefore it doesn't really enter the fossil record. Now, sharks are famous for the great number of fossil teeth that we find in the geological record. Now, teeth are pretty common as fossils for most groups of creatures, in part because teeth are often the hardest and strongest part of any creature's skeleton. But in the case of chondrichthians, and sharks in particular, they've done something special. They're replacing their teeth throughout their lifetimes. There's a continuous conveyor belt of teeth. So as one tooth is shed, a new one appears to replace it and take its position on the jaw. This is very different from what we see in creatures like ourselves, right? Mammals. We have two generations of teeth. We have an initial generation of so-called baby teeth, right? The ones that erupt when you're a child and then fall out, which are then replaced by your adult teeth, the ones that you keep, hopefully, for the rest of your life. By contrast, sharks go through many, many generations of teeth and are constantly shedding these teeth onto the seafloor, where they can be incorporated into sediments and then enter the fossil record to then be studied by paleontologists. All right, time for one last question. Generally speaking, what are the main differences in appearance between ancient sharks and those in the present day? So 
I think before talking about these ancient sharks, we should think a little bit about the diversity of sharks that are still with us. Obviously, we can think about things like great white sharks or even things like whale sharks or basking sharks, but there's a really remarkable diversity of form and ecology among modern shark species. There are, for example, deep sea sharks that glow in the dark. They bioluminesce, they produce their own light. There are sharks that spend their time skulking about on the sea floor with camouflage skin, lying in wait for their prey. There are even sharks that are capable of kind of ambling around exposed parts of reefs at low tide using their muscular fins. And all of this great diversity doesn't even consider the range of other kinds of body forms and lifestyles that we see in other cartilaginous fishes like the rays and skates and the rat fishes. So it shouldn't come as any surprise that when we look deep in the fossil record, there's also a remarkable variety of body plans and presumably ecologies and lifestyles among fossil chondrichthians, among these cartilaginous fishes. But I'd like to focus on just one of these today. And again, it's a kind of creature that has fossils on display at the Museum of Natural History. These are sharks called xenocanth sharks, so named because of a strange spine. Now, some sharks that are alive today have a spine in front of each of the two fins on their backs. Well, xenocanth sharks have that spine, but it's attached to the back of their skull, so it looks like there's almost an antenna sticking out of the back of their skull. They have a long, eel-shaped body. They have unusual teeth with two large cusps on them, so these V-shaped teeth. And the other thing that's unusual about them is they seem to have lived in freshwater settings. One of the major perks that sometimes people talk about with the Great Lakes is they don't have sharks. But these xenocanth sharks back in the Paleozoic and the early part of the Mesozoic, over 250 million years ago, seem to have inhabited lakes and rivers and streams. And they're elongate eel-like bodies are sometimes interpreted as just the right shape to make their way through vegetation clogged waters. We find them abundantly in some parts of the geological record along with other kinds of animals that you might recognize. For example, the sail-backed mammal relative Dimetrodon, this creature that's so well known from fossils in the American Southwest and which is also on display at the Museum of Natural History. There are a variety of other kinds of sharks as well, probably too many to discuss now, with a host of really peculiar features, ranging from enlarged teeth at the sort of chin of the lower jaw that form almost a buzzsaw-like shape, to other kinds of creatures with really strangely modified fins, or ones that look like they're doing similar things to modern cartilaginous fishes, but which belong to completely different groups. And one of the things as well is that because most of the shark fossil record, particularly as we get into younger parts of the geological record, is represented largely by teeth, many of the body forms and shapes of these ancient sharks is still unknown to us. All right. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for sending your questions. It's a great talking to you about early sharks and their relatives. And if you have any other questions, do send them in and we'll see if we can get them answered. All right, everyone. Take care. Stay safe.